the next chapter, 25, is entitled Jesus Among the Gods, the Uniqueness of Christianity. Okay, so what he wants to do in this chapter is talk about what makes Christianity unique among the world's religions. What's, what makes Christianity different? Okay, so first he points out that there are two, uh, two positions that suggest Christianity is not unique. The first one is that all religions are different pathways up the same mountain. Okay, so all religions seek to reach an experience of the divine. All religions seek to know who God is. And that's symbolized by a mountain. Different paths up the mountain are just the different religions. Christianity is one, Judaism is another, Islam is another, Hinduism is another, and so forth. Okay, the, the problem with that argument is that all those different religions have a completely different idea on two things. Number one, on whether or not there even is a God, because in Buddhism, there's no God. Uh, in Buddhism, the point, the problem, the problem in Buddhism is the human ego. Uh, what the Buddha <clears throat> discovered, or what he thought he discovered, is that, you know, he started out, he was a prince, lived in a palace. He was living a privileged life. And when he got out of the palace, he encountered uh, examples of terrible human suffering and pain. He discovered old old age and the difficulties of that. He discovered people who were indigent and starving. He discovered sickness. And finally, he discovered death. So the Buddha wanted to try to figure out a path that would get us out from under this endless cycle of suffering. And that's what the that's what this meditation was all about. You know, he ended up under the bow tree and he meditated, and he meditated, and he meditated, trying to find a way out of this this cycle of what he called uh, the cycle of desire, because it's really human desire in the end that causes suffering. If you desire something and you don't get it, you suffer. Or if something happens whereby something that you love is taken away from you, you suffer. So his answer was, you kill desire. If you kill desire, you're not going to suffer anymore because you don't, you have nothing to lose. When you don't desire anything, there's nothing to lose. So, um, so the Buddhist perspective doesn't even have God in it. Okay, that's number one. So that the idea that it's just another pathway to God is 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 incorrect. Um, the other problem with that point of view is that each religion has different prescriptions for how we get to God. So, for example, in Islam. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is not uh, intended to be an argument for the superiority of Christianity or anything like that. I'm not interested in arguing for the superiority of Christianity. I just want to make a distinction and, and talk about the differences in each one of these religions, because the differences are very real. In Islam, you're given a set of prescriptions. Uh, that makes you pleasing in the sight of God. And these include praying five times a day. Uh, it includes observing Ramadan. 
and, and during Ramadan, as you might know, Muslims uh, fast. It means you don't consume alcohol. If you go to a place like Dubai in the United Arab Emirates, they do have alcohol in the hotels, but if you are, if you are a Muslim, you're not supposed to buy it, okay? Because it's, it's forbidden in their religion to consume alcohol. So it's there only for visitors. Um, <clears throat> and you're supposed to make a pilgrimage to Mecca at least once in your life, okay? You do all these things and that makes you pleasing to God. So it's really a religion of prescriptions for behavior. Uh, and these, these behaviors are intended to demonstrate that you are loyal to Allah. You are loyal to God. You put God before anything else. If you do these things and you don't let other concerns get in the way from it, that means you're showing your ultimate loyalty to God. All right, and in Judaism, it's very similar. Uh, you have kosher laws. Uh, you have the, um, uh, you know, in, in Orthodox Judaism, they even observe the, the, the laws of how you cut your hair and, and you wear these, these little boxes on your forehead that have the Torah, the Ten Commandments in them. And on the Sabbath day, you don't do any work of any kind. Okay, so in other words, once again, what you have here is a religion that gives you a set of prescriptions that begin with circumcision at birth and go all the way to death by observing all of these dietary rules, the Sabbath and everything else. And if you do those things, that suggests that you're pleasing in the sight of God. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so... What about Christianity? How do we become pleasing in the sight of God? Well, according to the Christian faith, that's not possible. God's standards are too high for us. We can't reach them. Okay, if you, re if you, if you read the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5 to 7 in Matthew, Jesus' famous sermon. That's where he, you know, he, he gives these, <clears throat> excuse me, high moral teachings. Pray for your enemies. Do good to those who persecute you. Turn the other cheek. Be perfect like your heavenly father is perfect. All of these things which, of course, we can't do. We can't live up to them, right? So, according to Christianity, because human beings cannot be what God wants us to be, what God created us to be, holy, righteous people who are motivated primarily by agopic love, self-sacrificial love, and Jesus, of course, is the standard here, his life was perfect, agopic, self-sacrificial love. Nobody else that we know of ever lived up to that. He's the only one. Since we can't seem to manage to do that, how does God solve the problem? We can't get to God, so God comes to us in the person of a human being, Jesus Christ. And it's Jesus who makes the bridge between sinful human beings and a holy God. And he does that first by paying a debt that he did not owe. Okay, remember, you go all the way back to Genesis and it says the wages of sin is death. Jesus pays that debt, which he didn't owe, on our behalf. He does it for us. So that uh, 
we now uh, have become like, you know, to use one of his parables, have become like the lost sheep who was found by the shepherd. God becomes a human being, pays the price, and uh, gives us the, the gift of himself in Jesus Christ so that we, in turn, by putting our faith in him, number one, find forgiveness and mercy for the fact that we're not perfect people, all right, and never will be, but number two, because by accepting Christ into our lives, we are accepting the love, the perfect love of God, and that is going to enable us to become better people. So Christianity is a religion which suggested, here's, a, here's an interesting story about this that illustrates it very well. Um, when certain uh, Spanish missionaries came to, uh, I guess it was, well, yeah, they ended up in California, but they were also down in South and Central America. Anyway, the story is told about how they, they went to the Aztecs, okay? And they told the Aztecs uh, about the meaning of Christianity, that, that God became human and sacrificed himself on our behalf. And the, the, the Aztecs were baffled because according to their particular religion, the way you get to God is not because God came and sacrificed himself. The way you get to God is to make sacrifices to God. Okay, and that harkens back to the Roman world, right? Where um, Christians were persecuted precisely because they refused to make sacrifices to pagan gods and the emperor. Because the whole idea is that the way you get right with God is to make a sacrifice. You give something up, and that makes you right with God. What's unique about Christianity is that is not that we are called upon to make sacrifices to make ourselves right with God. It's rather that God sacrifices his own son to show us mercy and forgiveness and to enable us to become better people. So that when we put our faith in uh, Christ and we receive, and, and that, you know, Christianity really, it, it really boils down to this very simple point. Christianity is the gift of God. We sometimes say, no, Christianity is the gift of salvation. No, that's not it. Salvation is a result of God giving himself to us. Salvation is life with God. If we didn't have life with God, we wouldn't have salvation. So what Christianity really is, is the gift of God. Jesus came to give us the gift of himself. So it ends up being like what Paul said in Galatians when he said, it is no longer I who live, it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. That's the essence of the Christian faith, okay? And what makes it unique among all the religions is that it inverts this idea of sacrifice from one where humans make sacrifices to God to one where God sacrifices himself for us. So, <clears throat> so what we're talking about uh, when we talk about Christianity is first of all, receiving the gift of God who is love Remember in 1 John, John defines God by saying God is love. Uh, God's very being is love. When we receive 
you know, the gift of God into our hearts, we're receiving love. And that is how Christians and why Christians respond in love to uh, the suffering, hardships, and difficulties that people have in, in, in life. Um, obviously, Jesus expresses it most eloquently with his parable of the Good Samaritan, where the Samaritan sees the guy by the side of the road, and what does he do? He stops, he bandages up his wounds, he takes him to the inn, he pays for his care, and he tells the innkeeper, if he needs anything else, let me know, I'll take care of it. That's agopic love. And, and so why did he tell that parable? Because somebody asked him, good teacher, what is the greatest of the commandments? And he said, you shall love the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself. And then the guy said, but who is my neighbor? And then he told that parable. Okay. Who is your neighbor? Anyone you encounter in need is your neighbor. Um, <clears throat> so uh, so what, what makes Christians tick? Ideally, okay, we're sinners, so we don't always, uh, you know, we have pride like everybody else, and we like to take control of our lives, and <clears throat> we sometimes have desires that override our, uh, our conscience and, and make us, you know, do things that we pr probably know aren't the right thing to do. Uh, not me, of course. I'm always <laughs> right on. <laughs> um, but what, what, in the end, uh, what, what is to make Christians tick, of course, is love. Because, <clears throat> and Jesus expresses that very simply when he says at the end of his life uh, to his disciples, a new commandment I give you, and that is that you are to love one another as I have loved you. Okay, so that is the uniqueness of the Christian faith. Um, yeah, any questions or comments on that? Does that make sense to you all? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, the last chapter is called A Foretaste of Eternity. Um, and the question he asks is, why should a person adopt Christianity? In other words, what's in it for me? Suppose somebody were, you know, and, you know, it's, it's interesting. Christianity centers around a person, Jesus. At the center of the Christian faith is a person. Now, if you... If you are in a mixed crowd of some kind and you bring up the subject of Jesus Christ, you're going to get a variety of responses. Some people are going to say, shut up, I don't want to hear it. Some people are going to be effusive and say, oh, I'm a Christian too, blah, 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 blah. And some people are going to, you know, oh, my parents took me to church when I was young, but uh, I can't relate to that stuff anymore. You're going to get all kinds of responses, right? All centered on this one person. Um, what's interesting about Jesus is that whenever you bring him up in any context, people are not neutral. Everybody has a reaction of some kind. So the question becomes, why is it that this one person 
who lived in, a, in an obscure part of the Roman Empire 2,000 years ago and had a ministry of somewhere between 18 months and three years, we're not sure, and then died the death of a criminal, how is it that this guy who never wrote a thing had such an enormous impact on the entire world to the point where even the Christian Sabbath, which is Sunday, is observed by everybody now, virtually the world around. We measure time according to when Jesus was born. There's B.C. and A.D. And, and even if you decide, oh, we're not going to call it that anymore, we're going to call it the Common Era and before the Common Era, but it still amounts to the same thing. It's the same time, okay? You're just changing the label is all you're doing. Um, why did this guy have such a huge impact on the world? Um, did any of you, have any of you read the Da Vinci Code? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Long no. time ago, yeah. yeah. It's a book written by a guy named Dan Brown. Um, okay, so it, it's a book that illustrates uh, people's obsession with Jesus and trying to come to terms with him. Because when you read about Jesus in the Gospels, he makes a claim on your life. And it's a claim that you're either going to push back from, or it's a claim that's going to attract you. You're going to, you're going to come toward it. You're going to want to embrace him. So, you know, he, he elicits reactions from people that range from the desire to embrace who he was to the desire to push him away at all costs. Um, and you can see this in, in secular culture, because secular culture, you know, um, you know, it, 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 and it's typical, especially at Christmas time and at Easter time, uh, for uh, secular magazines to, to have articles about Jesus. And, you know, I just picked up uh, before Easter another National Geographical article about, uh, all about Jesus. So... Uh, he remains in the forefront of people's thinking. Now, the, the Da Vinci Code is an example of someone trying to come to terms with Jesus without allowing him to make a claim on your life. According to that book, if you look carefully at Da Vinci's painting of the Last Supper, you all know what I'm referring to now. That famous painting, it's on the wall of a convent in Milan, Italy. If you look at the person next to Jesus, um, Da Vinci meant this person to be the disciple John, because according to the Gospel of John, that's where John was sitting, right next to Jesus. But if you look carefully at that figure, it looks like it could be a woman, right? So the Da Vinci Code speculates that the person next to Jesus is not John, it's Mary Magdalene. Yeah. And that eventually Jesus marries Mary Magdalene. They move to France, <laughs> Southern France. <laughs> it's kind of nice down there in Southern France. They move to southern France, and they have children. And there's a genetic line to this day of people who are descended from Jesus and Mary Magdalene. Okay. Now, some people actually believe that theory. There's another guy who makes films. His name is Cameron. Uh, he, he made some famous movies. One about... Uh, Oh, I forget the name of it. About an alien uh, world. Um, he claimed that we found the tomb Jesus was buried in, and the remains were still there, so he couldn't have risen from the dead. Well, 
that's not the case. Nobody has found the tomb. The tomb, <laughs> actually, the tomb is encased inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which uh, Chris and Jerry, you'll remember going there. Yeah. yeah, that's where the tomb is. So, you know, nobody found the tomb. The tomb is, is uh, the tomb is a chapel at this point. Okay, so, um, but my point is, is that, and then, and then there's the, the, the Jesus Seminar biblical scholars who claim that everything in the New Testament is, is myth, right? The virgin birth is a myth. The crucifixion didn't happen. The resurrection's a myth. It's all, it was all made up, uh, you know, and then turned into this elaborate theology. Well, that's an interesting theory, right? But I think it's a little bit of a stretch to believe that a bunch of Galilean fishermen could come up with this elaborate theology. I just don't think that's possible, okay? These guys, you know, no, that's not possible. <laughs> so anyway, uh, in the end, um, we have so much historical evidence for the accuracy of the Gospels from Roman authors, from Josephus, the Jewish historian. Uh, we have all of these different uh, historical attestations of the fact that Jesus was a real person. He came from Nazareth. We all know that. When uh, at a certain age, he was baptized by John the Baptist. Uh, that, 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 that's been made clear in a number of other sources. We also know that he was known as a healer. Um, Josephus, the Jewish historian, said that Jesus was known for what he called startling deeds. And we know that he was a teacher and that he had a large following. And we also know that this following, which was about a hundred people at the time of Jesus' death and resurrection, it was about a hundred people, including the disciples, his family, and other people who were involved in the Christian movement. This little band of a hundred people eventually went out into the world and entered into the most massive religious conversion in human history. So that a few centuries later, a hundred people turned into 30 million people. Um, so his point uh, is that um, it's pretty clear from the historical evidence that the gospels are accurate that the best explanation for the resurrection is that it's really happened, just as they said it did. And that, um, so, you know, anyone who encounters Christ in the New Testament is faced with a choice. You can embrace him, you can push him away, you can try to ignore him, but the impact that he has on people when they confront him is enormous in every case. You can't just pretend he didn't exist. It's not possible. He had too big of an influence on human history to do that. Okay, that pretty much wraps it up. Any questions or comments? It was a great study. It sure was. Yeah. Yeah, sure enjoyed well, it. I'm yeah. glad you guys liked it. Yeah. Yeah.